Hi, and a very good morning to everyone. I'm Hansen, a librarian from the National Library Board. Now, thank you for joining us for Invigate 2021, an online symposium jointly organized by the National Library Board and the Singapore University of Social Science. Now, as we know, Singapore is one of the most rapidly aging populations in the world, with our elderly projected to make up almost half of our population by 2050. Now, as Singapore continues to face an uphill battle in meeting the needs of an aging population, more subject matter experts will be required to help tackle these issues in the near future. So for our panel discussion today, we have with us experts in the fields of aging, manpower and healthcare will be discussing the importance of gerontology as a discipline for the positive well-being of Singapore's aging population. Uh, now, I'm sure you're all eager to hear from experts, but before we start, I have just a few things I'd like everyone to take note of. Now, if you have headphones, uh, I would like to encourage everyone to use headphones for better audio quality. And we would like to encourage everyone to ask questions during this uh, panel discussion. So please leave your questions with the Q&A button. Do be reminded that this is a recorded session and the session is also live streamed to Facebook. So uh, hi to all of you who are joining us from Facebook. Now, how to ask a question? If you'd like to ask a question, just click on the Q&A icon below in the red box and type in your questions. Okay, I would uh, encourage everyone to um, ask your questions right to the speakers and try not to put as uh, anonymous because we're all here to share and learn today. Okay. Now, before we start the session proper, I'd like to take this opportunity to first introduce you to our moderator for today, Professor Meta. Now, Professor Meta is the founder of the first gerontology master program in Singapore at the Singapore University of Social Sciences with a master's and PhD in social work from the National University of Singapore. Professor Meta has vast experience in social work and aging issues. In addition to being on the editorial board of the Journal of Ethnic and Cultural Diversity in Social Work, she has also been the vice president of the Singapore Anti-Narcotics Association Management Board and president of the Singapore Association of Social Workers, a former nominated member of parliament and currently serving as justice of the peace. Professor Meta has contributed much to the social services in Singapore. And with that, I'd like to hand things over to Professor Meta, who will be introducing the rest of our speakers to you. Hi, Professor Meta, over to you. Hi, uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining this session on the value of gerontology as a specialization for holistic care. I wish to welcome both local and international participants to our symposium. For those who are not familiar with the gerontology discipline, I will spend a couple of minutes to explain before introducing the speakers. Gerontology entered the academic arena around 1950s, and it has drawn its core knowledge from several disciplines such as psychology, sociology, biology, and social work. It has a multidisciplinary approach towards aging and aged policy analysis. A gerontologist adopts a holistic view of an older adult. And this is especially important in family and health issues in the aging population. In developed countries, gerontologists are employed in a variety of spheres, such as housing, banking, hospitals, daycare, and residential institutions. In most countries, gerontology is offered at universities at the postgraduate level. That is why, for example, a social worker with a bachelor degree can go on to do a master's in gerontology and call himself or herself a gerontologist. We now move on to introducing the three 
outstanding panelists for today. First, Ms. Pei Kim Chu, with more than 20 years of experience in the aged care sector, Ms. Pei Kim Chu is currently Senior Advisor of South Foundation, where she oversees the overall strategy and management of the foundation and its four initiatives towards transforming the aging experience through positive mindset and systemic change. Next, we will have Mr. Tan Tai Kiat, a recipient of the Alice Lim Memorial Fund Award. He received this award to do his PhD in gerontology at the Singapore University of Social Sciences. Taiket was also the first recipient of the Singapore LSE Trust Postgraduate Scholarship and obtained a Master of Science in Public Policy and Administration at London School of Economics and Political Science. He is currently COO at Sing Health Community Hospitals and COO Environmental Sustainability at Sing Health. Next, we have Ms. Chelvin Lowe, a graduate of the Masters in Applied Economics program from Nanyang Technological University. She focused on economic, econometric analysis, sorry, shift share analysis and monetary policy reviews. Ms. Lowe is currently the Director of Job Skills Insights Division in Skills Future Singapore, which is a statutory board under the Ministry of Education. Now I will hand over to Kim Chu, who is the first speaker. The time is all yours now, Kim Chu. Thank, thank you, Prof. Thanks. Right, so I share my screen. Hello, everyone. Uh, okay. Hello, everyone. Yeah. So thank you very much for uh, having South Foundation here and uh, really happy to be able to share. So what, what I'm going to do for the next 10 minutes is really to share a project that we have uh, called Community of uh, Successful Aging, uh, for short, COMSA. And it is an experiment in building a ground up community wide care ecosystem in Singapore. I think hopefully from there, we can see how important the, the value of gerontology is, you know, in the design, in the implementation of, of this project. Okay, so uh, next slide. I can't, uh, sorry, I can't move the slide, yeah. So, let me try again. I'll stop share and I'll try again. I'm not sure what's happening. Okay, right. Um, just a little, uh, some words about the Sound Foundation for those of you who may not have heard of the foundation before. We are a not-for-profit organization, uh, basically around, we're about 28 years old uh, for this year. And this is how we are organized. So if you look at it, we have four initiatives, but basically, essentially, our, our focus is very much on transforming the aging experience, whether it's through, uh, you know, uh, developing service models, implementing running services through development and training, or, you know, through community development and, and research, for example. Okay, so I think the next few slides really highlight the issue of aging in Singapore. And I think I don't need to say very much about it because I think all of you know the numbers, right? I think earlier Hansing also mentioned, yeah, like by 2050, almost half the population will be uh, 65 and above, but closer, much, much closer right now is 2030, where we will see 25% of, of the population 65 and above. And, uh, and coupled with that, you know, the average life expectancy of the Singaporean has also gone up, including the average healthy years of the Singaporean. And so basically what it means is that, you know, come 2030, uh, we will see almost a million of older person in Singapore, right? And but of this, this 
of, of this 900,000 to a million older Singaporeans, most of them, will, most of us will actually be healthy. Around 87% will be healthy and independent. But there are a, a few, you know, there are about 10%, about 15% actually, who will need some kind of assistance. Like you can see, you know, maybe 8% will need walking aid, you know, 3% uh, assistant assistive device, and perhaps 1% 1, 1 will really be bait bound. So going forth, what the country needs will really be able to provide for all this spectrum, this entire spectrum of older persons with this different profile, right? And I, I think one key factor amongst all the older Singaporeans, uh, whether you're healthy, uh, independent, or you need care, would really be the focus of aging in place. That all of us wants to live in the environment where we are most comfortable with, uh, in, most comfortable in, where we feel the most connected, right? Where we are surrounded by people who can support us and, you know, and where we can contribute, which is really, really important. But nonetheless, you know, um, the last so many years, you know, I guess the last 10, 20 years on the ground, we're beginning to see some of these challenges. Yeah, so the list here are, are really currently some of the challenges that, you know, all of us are, are facing on the ground, be, be, you know, be, be they uh, service providers, you know, um, researchers, policy makers, these are some of the issues that we are seeing on the ground. And so I guess the, the, the key question is, what do we do about them? What would be the solution to, this, um, to these challenges that we are seeing and to these trends you know, that, that we are seeing on the ground? And I think we know that, you know, since around 2015, there have been two very important policy that came on, you know, two very important strategic policy, really. One is the uh, Action Plan for Successful Aging that was launched in 2015. And the other one is really the Healthcare Transformation Plan that was launched in 2017. So those two really uh, sort of set the direction of where we are going next and how do we then tackle some of these issues that we see here. So for the South Foundation, you know, taking, you know, look, understanding that all these challenges and these trends that we see, uh, we, we, we launched a project called COMSA, right? This Community for Successful Aging around 2014, 15, like that. And, and basically it is a ground up, as you can see, it is a ground up initiative, ground up community-wide initiative uh, with the focus of enabling aging in place. Okay, so this is, these are the different components of uh, COMSA, if for short we call it. And so the two main components of COMSA, as you can see, is the care system, you know, which you can see on your right hand side in all the green boxes, you know, a, a, an integrated care system that is integrated with all the service providers on the ground, as well as with institutions like the hospital, which is very key. And the other one, the other component in COMSA is really community development. You know, how do we then build uh, a, a community, you know, where the community can come to celebrate longevity, where the older persons in this community are, feel empowered and participate and are, are part of the uh, active participation and have part active participation in the community. So this is very much what COMSA is about. Of course, the other piece that's really important is infrastructure, right? The housing, the transport, uh, the long-term care facilities, you know, and how, how COMSA can influence some of this uh, development in infrastructure. But infrastructure, of course, is very, very important to, to enable aging in place. So what are some of the key principles that um, COMSA is built on, really? You know, so these are some of the key examples that uh, COMSA is built on. And if, if you look at this key, this, some of these key examples, I'm not going through all of them, but if you look at all these key examples, it basically tells you a couple of things, right? It, it says that, first of all, the, the approach to this care, to this community for successful aging is very much holistic. It's biopsychosocial health and well-being. So it's not just about medical problems, but it's also very much about the social and the psychological well-being of the older person. It's about a seamless integrated health and social care system. Care has to be seamless and has to be integrated so people don't fall through the cracks. So this is what Comsa tries to do to build 
together with our partners on the ground, a seamless integrated health and social care system. Uh, it needs to be population-based approach. It really needs to take the entire population into consideration to see what the needs are, right? Uh, it is, uh, you know, it's, it's, it needs to focus on preventive health as well and not just on acute care. Uh, it needs to be multi-pronged. It, it needs to involve all stakeholders, different stakeholders in the community, including the grassroots and even the businesses in the community. And last but not least, is intergenerational especially with a focus on the family. So intervention you know, within the care services needs to be family-centric, for example. So these are some of the, the key principles that COMSA is built on. And uh, so it, is, it started, uh, right now it's 2021. So we are into phase two of COMSA actually. So this is what we did in phase one. You know, We did uh, surveys in the community. We try and understand you know, what the needs are. And through that, we develop a, a risk screener, a, what we call the COMSA risk screener. The community development started, started building platforms actually for social participation and really also to focus on developing the self-care efficacy of older people in the community. Then service system development, and that's where we started uh, building up the care management services but also very much uh, the primary care within the community and integrating primary care together with care management into a new model that is called the person-centered medical home model. Yeah, and of course, we also need to develop service network, including the GPs in that region as well. So right now in phase two, we are what we call a one-stop integrated longevity central. Okay, and so this is how it looks like today. Right, you have the care piece, and the care piece is very much an integrated biopsychosocial care system, uh, basically helm anchored by the person-centered medical home, which is uh, an integration of primary care together with care management. Uh, that is also a, a center-based and home-based care for frail elders. You know, uh, then that is also that whole piece around preventive health, preventive care. And it's really very much about, you know, um, self developing self-care efficacy, uh, engagement and activation of elders through our learning room program and through the Comsa Kawan, which is really a cafe, you know, uh, a drop-in cafe for elders, right? And basically the community development carries on, you know, with very much focusing on uh, developing platforms for participation and empowerment of older person. And of course, we are still very much linked to all our service providers, to the NHG healthcare system, because this project is in Wongpo, which uh, then our tertiary hospital is NHG, right? Tan Tok Seng Hospital, the grassroots organizations, uh, the volunteers in the community, and last but not least, the family caregivers, right? So these are the key components of uh, COMSA as it stand today. And these are some of the pictures to show, you know, um, just give you a, a sense of what's been happening there, more pictures, and uh, just a little bit about the uh, community development. So there are three main focus in community development. One, like I mentioned earlier, is the self-care, the development of self-care efficacy amongst older people. How do they, how can they better take care of their own health, their psychological and social well-being? The care for community civic action. This is a participation piece. You know, how can elders become a stronger voice within the community? How can they reclaim that, the role that they've, they've lost, so to speak, you know? And uh, the last but not least, but really also the, the community. How do the community look at older people? Because we can have very nice care system, uh, you, you know, but, but if the community does not embrace the older person does not embrace longevity, then we're still not there, right? So really creating a positive image of older people or, or working together with the community to build the positive image of older people are very key as well for community development. And uh, this is in the phase two of community development, uh, a project called Empower, which again is you know helping the older person to focus on those three components that, that I've mentioned about. Okay, uh, last but not least, you know, the entire uh, COMSA project also has got a evaluation piece because really, you know, we do want to know what works and what don't, what doesn't work, all right? We also want to know what all the things we've done. Are we creating any impact? Are we really moving towards aging in place? And so these are some of the evaluation uh, uh, 
the projects that have been tied to this, uh, this, this uh, community for successful aging. A study on the, the uh, COPAC study, which is really on the primary care and the care management uh, program. Uh, the cluster research really answering the question of what works and what doesn't work. You know, it's a more process kind of evaluation, really looking at what works for whom and why. And then, of course, I've mentioned the, uh, the BPS risk screener development, the COMSA risk screener development. And uh, last but not least, also a dementia care system study. Because within one of the care management services that we have is a specialized care management service focusing on dementia care. And uh, there is a study attached to it. So the evaluation is very much uh, part of the COMSA, uh, the, the project that we've, we've been embarking on since 2014. Okay, so uh, that's the last of my slides. So thank you very much. This is an older person, an elder, and joined Durian at our Epic Day Center. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Kim Chu. That was really, really a very interesting presentation. And uh, I could see the gerontology principles running through the entire project, such as life course, community systems, preventive care, multidisciplinary grounds up approach, and of course, the family centric uh, focus. Now I hand over to the next speaker, who is Taiket. He is a PhD student at SUSS. Over to you, Taikyat. Thank you, Prof. Thank you for this opportunity to share my perspectives on the value of specialization in gerontology. In my short presentation, I will share how I have benefited studying and practicing gerontology. As a healthcare practitioner, a community volunteer, a SUSS student, and importantly, a caregiver. I can appreciate the multidisciplinary nature of gerontology. So is gerontology an art or a science? In my opinion, it is both. Some will say that it's an art to age gracefully, and we also learn about the science of aging. Gerontology looks at aging holistically, from cultural and environmental contexts to biological, psychological, social, and even spiritual aspects. This is what makes gerontology an interesting subject to study and practice. The photo on the left highlights the interactions between study and practice. This 2019 Straits Times article showcases the collaboration between SUSS Gerontology and Sing Health Community Hospitals for SUSS students to better understand the needs of seniors and their caregivers in a healthcare setting. The photo in the center shows Professor Carol Ma, who is the head of SUSS Gerontology program, sharing about Giragogy, or the theory and practice of learning for seniors. Last year, I penned the commentary on how to help seniors to be more digitally connected, that sustainable digital caregiving support is important for seniors to go digital, especially during this COVID period. Caregivers who know their seniors well can cater to their bio, psycho, social learning needs, instead of a one size fits all approach. I'm really grateful for my life course to experience the art and science of gerontology. This logo's mosaic shows the colors of my life story, where I study, where I work, and even what I do during my free time. I still fondly remember during my primary school days, the regular visits to Geelang Sarai Market 
with my grandmother to buy her favorite snacks. And my learning journey continues on aging and demography, be it from economics, public policy, and of course, from my PhD gerontology program at SUSS. From my public transport experience on how to make our transport system more age-friendly to implementing digitalization initiatives for senior workforce and caring for seniors and their caregivers at Sing Health Community Hospitals. My life course, together with my community experience, interacting with senior volunteers, taught me that gerontology is both an art and a science. Understanding the art and science of gerontology is useful in caregiving. I am a caregiver to my parents and my parents-in-law for almost 20 years. This photo was taken during our family holiday in China five years ago. My dad on the left, 80 this year, is a cancer survivor. My mom in blue jacket does not use a smartphone. Whereas my mother-in-law, also a cancer survivor, always engages me on how to use her smartphone apps, including Trace Together. I did Tai Chi training with my father-in-law. Through these interactions and a deeper understanding of them as a person, my care and giving roles have been a meaningful and enriching one. It is mutual and symbiotic care and giving. From a practice and even study perspective, I am still fascinated by the biological, psychological, social, and even spiritual aspects of caregiving. Please pardon my simplistic visualizations of biological, psychological, social, and spiritual aspects. But this perhaps capture how I perceive these aspects for my mom and dad and the implications to caregiving. My mom is a church goer and my observations are that her spiritual needs precede biopsychosocial. Unlike her, my dad is contented in the middle of biopsychosocial plus spiritual intersection. That is, after going to church with my mom and have his coffee and chit chat, with their khakis at their favorite Topayo coffee shop. Knowing what matters to my parents is crucial for caregiving so that I can engage them meaningfully. My dad definitely knows my mom well enough to bring the church to her through his smartphone when she's at home during this COVID period. I taught my dad how to use his smartphone and their coffee kaki sent the church web link to him. I could really see and feel the smiles in my mom and dad. Indeed, a gerontological understanding of aging matters, and it is important to embrace a multidisciplinary view of aging. Starting from a person-centered perspective, Having a biopsychosocial and spiritual appreciation of what matters to our seniors. This appreciation is useful for care and giving, how we show care and give. I view care and giving as a mutual and symbiotic process, and it brings meaning to aging and caregiving. The caregivers can receive care from our seniors just like my mom and my mother-in-law who gives me nice dinners. Caregiving can be a virtuous circle such that our seniors can still enjoy autonomy, competence, and relatedness in their self-determined way. Autonomy as in going to the market every morning to buy vegetables, competence in cooking tasty dishes, and relatedness in relationship when they cook for their son and son-in-law. That's the value of specializing in gerontology to understand and appreciate the different strokes 
for different folks from a multidisciplinary view. And for a caregiver like me, this value is invaluable. Once again, thank you NLB and SUSS for this opportunity to share my perspectives. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Taiket, for that very personal sharing. And I can see that every cell in you has some dimension of gerontology. You walk the talk, I think, every day from the time you wake up until the time you sleep. Because I have known you over the years, and I think your exposure to gerontology has made you a very, very dedicated caregiver, as well as uh, your parents are in a better space because you understand their health conditions as well as their social needs. So for the audience out there, I think Taiket is an example of how this journey into gerontology helps us to prepare to age gracefully. And I speak from my own experience as well. I started this journey about 30 years ago. And I think today, as a senior, I think I have all the knowledge I need to gracefully age. So this can be one incentive for some of you who are already kindled by the uh, gerontology knowledge that you are listening to today. So please do join us in this journey. With that, I now move to the third speaker, Chelvin. Over to you, Chelvin. Thanks so much, Prof Meta. Very good morning to everyone, darling. In. Um, first and foremost, allow me to thank uh, SUSS as well as NLB for inviting us to talk, uh, for inviting me to talk. Um, for the next 10 minutes, I'll share a little bit on the future of jobs and skills in the care economy. Um, next slide, please. I just a short, very short introduction of our SSG, Skills Future Singapore. Um, um, we are the National Skills Authority in, uh, in Singapore, and our role under the Ministry of Education really is to drive um, uh, lifelong learning as well as skills mastery. And as we move towards a skills-led economy, um, our, one of our key focus is really to anticipate skills demand ahead of time and then to influence the uh, skills supply ecosystem. In fact, to do so, we work very closely with SUSS, uh, Singh Health Community Hospital, as well as our foundation, among of, amongst our many other partners. Next slide, please. So over the last year, actually COVID-19 has shown us that um, uh, the need for a strong care ecosystem is more important than ever. Uh, by care in SSG, we mean not just uh, healthcare, but we also mean wellness. We mean behavioral care. We mean social care, child care, as well as aged care. In fact, according to the World Economic Report that you see on the screen, the care economy, which is uh, the, bowl, uh, the box at the bottom, the number of it, it will account for at least 40% of the total job opportunities created in 2022, right? And if you look at the number of 260, it's even more than uh, the, the data and engineering professions combined. That shows how important actually the care economy will become in the near uh, years ahead. Next slide, please. At the same time, we're also seeing an uh, increasing shift to tech enabled uh, health, wellness, as well as care provision. And this is made possible by a wide range of um, digital health services, uh, such as remote patient monitoring, as well as digital health apps, uh, some of which Taikit mentioned earlier, right? And today, we're also seeing more and more startups coming into this space uh, to develop solutions for better diagnostics, uh, better preventive care, as well as personalized care. Next slide, please. Another area that we have seen increasing importance over the years is the recognition that actually a large part of our um, health outcomes is not determined by healthcare, by the amount of healthcare we receive. Uh, instead, it's largely influenced by uh, what we, the professionals call the social determinants of health. Right? And this includes our social environment, our social support system, as well as our social care. Um, I've had the good opportunity to work with Prof Lee and his team in Singha Community Hospital to uh, support the social prescribing program that was rolled out in 2019. 
And during COVID, they also moved the program online. And we saw how it enabled many seniors to remain connected socially via some of these digital tools and access online content to keep their minds active. Next slide, please. To cater to these many different aspects of care, um, we have seen many innovative care models uh, emerging over the years. Basically, is to improve the quality, the accessibility, and the well-being of care. So some example is Homage and as well as Jagami, who uses uh, technology and data to match caregivers to those in need of home care services. I've been a beneficiary of this, so I know how important it is, and I fully, fully, really, really appreciate for new uh, models like this today, which wasn't available in the past. Uh, Alien Healthcare, whom we also work very closely with Bernie and his team, right? They integrate hospitality services together with healthcare services. And basically, when they combine both disciplines together, it enhances the physical, the psychological, as well as the emotional aspects of care. A uh, Mayo Clinic, um, based in the US, um, is they enable they leverage technology together with community partners to enable what we call a hospital at home model where they combine in-person care, remote monitoring, clinical care, as well as caregiver support. Next slide, please. In Japan, uh, of course, um, this, this, this um, discipline is a lot more taken at the holistic level. We see many of the efforts coming together to help our, age, our seniors age in um, dignity as well as in independence. From malls to activities, food services, catering to lifestyles of seniors, to homes in assisted living spaces. Many of them take a holistic care as well as science-based approach to health and care practices. By redesigning products and services to cater to physical, psychological, and social needs of what they call a the grand generation, it has significantly enhanced the well-being of the seniors in uh, Japan. Next slide, please. So what does all this mean uh, for the future of jobs and skills in the care economy? The slide that uh, the chart that you see on the screen shows us many of the in-demand skills of care professionals today. So beyond care uh, and therapy support services, we also see uh, uh, care professionals needing to collaborate uh, and engage with professionals, clients and the families. We see that they also need a lot of skills in infection control, uh, group work, uh, psychological practice, as well as budget management and consultative skills. Like please. And besides the in-demand skills earlier, these are some of the fastest growing skills that we noticed among care professionals. Uh, 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 specifically beyond just patient care, we also see operations, analytics, um, case management fast emerging. If you go further down, you also see skills like hospitality as well as customer satisfaction emerging. And then also skills relating to food nutrition and sports. These signal the focus on other aspects of health and especially important gerontology as well uh, in the area of health and wellness aspects. Next slide, please. This slide shows uh, some examples of the emerging jobs in the care economy. Uh, just a spotlight on some, right? You will see here there's a good mix of care roles, care manager, care specialist, care coordinator. There's also a good mix of uh, hospitality roles, right? Community engagement roles like community advisor, for example, digital roles like business intelligence, uh, 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 as well as design roles like, for example, a design coordinator. Right? It really is to make sure that we design the whole experience uh, from end to end from a person-centered perspective. Next slide, please. And based on some of the job posting data locally and uh, overseas, we also see that tech, uh, employers are not just looking for hard skills. They're also looking for a common theme uh, that keeps spreading across is the need for the right mindset and the beliefs and the willingness to engage and adopt multidisciplinary approaches to care. Uh, for example, uh, uh, what you see here is Apex Harmony Lodge, right, which is the first uh, 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 purpose-built home for people with dementia in Singapore. Um, they're hiring therapeutic program assistants, right? What you see, the skills that they need is empathy skills, care skills, therapy skills, a partnership as well as influencing skills. Next slide, please. So these skills, um, or what we call skills to build skills, are really part of our 16 critical core skills that uh, Skills Future Singapore launched in 2020. Uh, we grouped the skills into three buckets, uh, mainly thinking critically, which is on the left, 
interacting with others, which was on the top, and staying relevant at the bottom, uh, on the right. We believe that skills such as trans transdisciplinary thinking, sense making, customer orientation, building inclusivity, collaboration, communication, learning agility, as well as self management, will be critical core skills coming up for the care economy. Next slide, please. And one example I want to share is Doris. Doris is currently a senior assistant care manager at South Foundation. She moved from a previous career as an accountant to the agent care sector seven years ago. She shared that soft skills like communication, transdisciplinary thinking, collaboration, sense making, and developing people were important skills that helped her to develop herself in this sector. And these skills enable her to communicate effectively to her residents, assess across biosocial as well as um, uh, 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 social aspects, develop holistic care plans, as well as regularly coach her more junior colleagues. Next slide, please. And for audience in our midst who are thinking how we can also contribute to this sector, uh, SkillsFuture Singapore has also curated a list of SG United courses. They are heavily subsidized in terms of cost fees. And not only can these courses be paid through your SkillsFuture credit, SSG will also provide training allowance when you go through this training with our training providers. And ultimately, these programs it will equip you with the skills in the various aspects of gerontology to access the job opportunities after the training. Last but not least, for community care providers in our midst in the audience today, SSG has also worked with partners like Kong Wai Shu Hospital as our skills future Queen Bee to contextualize modular upskilling courses, tech adoption workshops, as well as uh, workplace learning modules for com care organizations. We hope many of these, uh, we hope many of our audience here today will take some of these opportunities and invest in these skills. And these skills, we all heard, is not just relevant for our work, but it will definitely also benefit our personal lives. With that, I've come to the end of my presentation, and I hope this has been a useful sharing. And then I pass the time back to Prof. Meta. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chelvin. Your contribution is quite different from the earlier two speakers. So I'm glad we have a good range of topics for our audience today to go back and chew and also tap some of these uh, skills future uh, subsidies available as well as look at some of these as a second career or even third career option. Because in Singapore, we are encouraged to work till the 70s. So if you imagine somebody at the age of 55 moves on to a second career in say uh, community care and then a third career as a healthcare assistant, as we heard the other day that there are many uncle caregivers now, many uh, elderly men around 60 plus who are going into healthcare assistant training. So they would make very good uh, caregivers, uh, professional caregivers, because they would understand how someone who is the same age as themselves or older than themselves is coping. So I'm glad you have talked about the care economy because the care economy is going to be a very very big chunk of the labor force in future and we need to start preparing for that because with our fast aging population we may need more professional caregivers but having said that i'm glad you also mentioned that care economy is not just about health care it is also about wellness so we need people in the community who can teach exercise, who can teach false prevention, and who can also connect with seniors uh, as volunteers, for example, or even social ambassadors. So this is the way of the future, I feel, because the healthcare burden on the state has to have some point at which uh, it will then become a taxpayer burden. So we need to have schemes like uh, volunteer management schemes. I also would like to uh, thank you for introducing some of these international models uh, in Japan and other countries because uh, Singapore needs to learn as well about what's going on 
out there. So as a moderator, <clears throat> I will now uh, encourage more questions to come forward. And our speakers have said their piece. Now it's time for our audience to uh, encourage our speakers to share on topics that they will be uh, interested in. So I will start off with a question for Ms. Pei. With intergenerational community bonding, what plans are there to teach the young children these days about helping with care and engagement with older persons? This uh, person asking the question says, my experience is that parents are too stressed and busy to be proper role models. Any of the other speakers may also uh, unmute themselves and join in this discussion. Okay. Uh, th thank you, Prof. And thank you for the question. Very interesting question. Um, as Prof was, uh, you know, say, uh, mentioning the question, I, I was thinking, you know, I want to share this, this uh, program that we have. We still run this program, not so much now, but we used to run it a lot. And it's called Guided Autobiography. Uh, some of you might have heard of it. And um, when we ran that program a number of years ago, we had a project that we work with school age children, school going children. I think they were sec one, sec twos, basically getting these young, young uh, individuals to, to be the interviewers of older person as they do their life review. And we, we thought the, the results of that experiment, of that project was really, really interesting because what happens is, the, old, the, younger, the younger person, the, the young individuals, then really change the way they look at an older person. Because to a young person, if you ask a young person how old is old, you know, the entire 40 years old will be old, you know. But, um, but and, and I think to, to young people, all older people look alike. There's just one mass of old people, you know. But I think when, they, when they, the kids did this, guided autobiography, they, they became the interviewers. They interviewed the older person. Then they began to learn about the, this older person, their, their life experiences, for example, what they've gone through. They begin to see this older person in a very different light. They became individuals. They became person in their own right with their own life experiences. And they could even connect. I remember there was a boy who said, oh, wow, he, he played uh, he loved to play football when he was young and I love football too. And they find common platforms where they can communicate. So, so I think, you know, intergenerational bonding, we know it's very, very important. It, 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 you know, if we really want to see a thriving older person's, you know, aging in place and all that thing that we talked about, then this is very key. And I, I think, you know, this is, this is like a guided autobiography, getting younger people to be more involved, understanding the older person, having a different mindset of who they are and what older people are, will be very, very key, yeah. Thank you, Kim Chu. And uh, I would like to uh, pose a question for Tai Ket. Somebody is asking, I am in my mid fifties. What are the options to move into the field of gerontology as my next career? Appreciate your insights into this. Thanks, like thanks, Prof. Yeah. So, so um, uh, as you all know, I um, I'm a student at SUSS, and uh, when I did my first year study in uh, grad dip in uh, gerontology. I have classmates who are also in their fifties, so uh, some of them they move into tech and uh, innovation, and uh, others also move into uh, the community care sector. So I would I would uh, really say uh, it depends very much on the interest and the strength of that person, and how they can also uh, bring forth uh, their perspective and also their experience in exploring uh, career opportunities. And uh, as um, um, Kelvin um, shared earlier, with regards to uh, the different training and also the skills that are required in industries, I think these are opportunities uh, that uh, anyone can, uh, can leverage and also look into uh, regardless of age. Right. Thank you. Next one is for Kelvin. 
this sector is not lucrative enough for young people especially those who may not have previous experience in caregiving or related areas. How can we encourage more young people to consider this as a career option, even if they do not have personal involvement, in the same way that students often want to go into careers like engineering and marketing? Chelvin? Thanks, Prometa. Um, in fact, I find this uh, question somewhat related to the first one. I just wanted to share that there are many aspects. Uh, um, today, I think there are many options. Employment is just, uh, of, uh, uh, formal employment is just one, right? Uh, we've also seen like uh, efforts that we are working on on another part of our work with SUSS, which is on volunteer management. So today, uh, we see a lot of volunteers coming in and they want to volunteer in different organizations, including Comcare, including healthcare organizations. And what this can allow the young, our younger uh, 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 workforce to have a, have a sense of what it's like. And as part of the volunteer, as part of you coming in as a volunteer, the, um, the center also provides you with training in some of these skills and gives you first-hand experience. And as part of that, you can decide for yourself whether this is something that you really have a passion for. Because I realized in this sector, it is really very much uh, the passion for the sector and the, the, the really willingness and a deep desire, right, to really want to be involved in the lives of our older people or older persons, right? So in a sense, the volunteer manage, uh, volunteer part of your uh, experience can help give a flavor of what it's like. There are many organizations today we know um, that are creating new roles and need not be roles that you see today. So like, for example, Zao that we work with very closely, HMI, for example, they are creating new roles that are combining um, um, roles with, for example, technology, for example, so to, to make the work a lot more interesting, to make the work, um, to change, to keep the roles in uh, uh, tandem with what the, uh, the new economy is looking for. So, for example, everybody needs digital skills. But where does digital skills come in? In the space of uh, a wellness provision, in the uh, terms of care provision. That's where I think um, from a from an organization perspective, from a care economy perspective, we need new ideas from the younger generation. And I think there are firms today out there who is prepared to redesign roles that can cater to aspirations of our younger officers today, our younger workforce today. It need not be what the roles you see today. In fact, many of the roles that you see across many different sectors today didn't exist five years ago. In healthcare, in comcare, in a care economy, we see the same trends coming up. It might be moving a bit slow in the past, but I think with COVID, everybody realizes that it's very important to make sure we, we pay a lot of attention to this. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. I have a question for Kim Chu here. Uh, will Komsa expand to other housing estates? And how does the development of the Komsa model compare with uh, the Kampong Admiralty model and the Bukit Batok assisted facility project model? Thank you, Prof. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, so actually, I think if, if we look at uh, what's been happening to the to the um, aged care sector, the elder care sector in the last few years, we'll see that there, there, are, there are already a lot of uh, projects coming up that focuses on, you know, a, a population health appro approach focusing on community development and care development within the sector itself. You know, I think some of them would be what AIC has been trying to do, developing this community of care. They, they're running a pilot on that. And I believe that all the different regional health systems are also working with the partners on the ground to develop the, the care system in the community and integrated care systems in the community. So I, I've, I feel that in that from that perspective, Sao didn't think that, uh, you know, we, we, we will continue to work with our partners on the ground and see what, what we can do together in a collaborative manner, but uh, not in that sense to bring, uh, to, to start replicate another COMSA in that sense in another uh, uh, locality. But what, what we really hope is that what we've learned from COMSA, you know, that so far seven years, seven to eight years now, that, that we can extract the principles, the very key principles that needed that, that are very useful and relevant. How can we then, you know, continue to work uh, within ourselves, but also with our partners 
to really develop um, this you know, aging in place, to really make aging in place work, to enable aging in place in, in that sense. Because I think in, one thing for sure in our experience uh, in, in Comsa is that we can't work alone. You know, we will never succeed if we work alone uh, because alone, we does not make the community, right? We really need to work with the stakeholders on the ground. That's really, really key. To, to build that system, we need to work with our stakeholders. So that's something that, that you know, come to us very clearly. As for the comparison with Kampong, uh, Admiralty and Phuket Patok, I want to go back to that three components that when we first uh, designed Comsel, we felt those three components were very key. One, if you look at it, one is about the care system. The other one is about the, um, the environment, right? The infrastructure, the environment. And the third is the community development. So, so to us, those three are very key components. So I think whatever project, whether it's Bukit Patak or Kampong Amity or Kamsa, I, I think as long as we can build those three components on the ground, um, I, I feel that you know, the, the, they will be key to, to the success of, uh, of any of those projects. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Kim Chu. I would also add that uh, Komsa is different from Kampong Admiralty and Bukit Batok because in both those projects, people move into the new flats, whereas for Komsa, people continue to live where they have been living. They don't need to move. So it is, uh, in a way, you can call it a natural continuing living organism in the neighborhood and uh, what you are doing is to enhance it further so this is one major difference and i would hope to see comsa being uh, replicated in other parts of singapore because it has a very grounds up approach unlike kampong admiralty at bukit Bato, which are uh, spun from uh, statutory boards uh, so there is a difference here. I would also like to pose this question to all the panelists. This is to do with private sector involvement. There is an exponential growth in senior population, increasing demand for infrastructure and services. Many, cannot, many can afford to pay and need not rely on public funding or SSOs. What do you think can be done to encourage more private sector involvement in this area? Thank you. Anybody uh, is ready, can start. Uh, yes, uh, Prof, uh, if I can just offer my personal thoughts on this. So one will be actually is the private and the people sector. How the private sector can engage the people sector and engender uh, spirit of volunteerism uh, on the ground such that everyone can co-create what they want and have a stake in, uh, in developing the initiatives. And this brings on to my the other point, which uh, the private sector also has a part to play in uh, corporate social responsibility or even community social responsibility. And it can be in big and small way. And I think this is one area that the private sector uh, can work together with the stakeholders on the ground. Thank you. Chelvin, I think the uh, model you mentioned, Alium, Healthcare is a private sector. Private model. That's yeah. Right. Maybe uh, you That's have right. some views on that. Um, in a way, I fully agree, Takit. I think as the care economy matures, we need to see a lot more private sector participation, right? And with them also, they, they bring with them um, uh, different skills and different technologies and different models that they've probably seen elsewhere. That So for example, Ilium uh, is part of Opel, right? Which then, you know, they've tested, tried to test on these models overseas and they bring over here. Um, and, and therefore, but I, I think in the past, if you look back uh, se seven years ago, you probably won't see a model that Ilium has today which is very much a very different approach to looking at uh, aged care, right? Looking at uh, really, really aging in um, dignity. It, it's a very different experience. Of course, there will be requirements from our regulatory perspective to allow sandboxes like that to happen. But we think this will become uh, increasingly more and more common in a sense. And like what Taikit said about the volunteerism, in fact, we are seeing a lot of these uh, voices on the ground coming on 
And especially in the younger generation, I think this is something very, very important and very close to their heart. And I think what we can do is beyond what the regulatory require, requirements are, we can engender more and more conversations around this and get uh, groups of people to take up some of these uh, small projects to pilot, right? And we can, of course, create spaces within the various uh, econo uh, uh, government agencies to try and support. And there's, um, there's, re there's definitely receptacles to do, the, do so. And I do expect in the next five years or so, we, we should start seeing more and more of these. In fact, I'm hearing a lot of private sector players who wants to come into the space. And I think there's value. It's just that I think we need to find where the sweet spot are so that we, we don't make the, you know, from a certain perspective, it's the price points and the affordability. So we don't tilt the balance uh, to the other end. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Uh, Kim Chu? Okay, uh, yeah, thanks. I, I totally agree with what Shelvin and Taiget said. And, and I think it's true that there is definitely a role for the private sector in, in various different aspects, right? Whether it's voluntary, corporate, volunteerism or, or you know uh, service pro provision you know uh, or, or just coming together you know the the tech part for example you know a lot of it are yeah. the, the private sector is very interested in that and how can they then work together with the the you know whether with the policy makers or with the service providers to 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 um, develop this tech blueprint I, I don't think we have one yet really yeah so so there is definitely a role yeah uh, somebody made a comment that maybe a softer touch of regulatory mm. compliance may yeah. help uh, more private sector involvement. Mm. Uh, there is a question on dementia. And uh, the question is to do with the Sambawang uh, project. There was a tender placed for developing a village in Sambawang for dementia uh, patients. Uh, and uh, it looks like the tender didn't go through, but I do not have much knowledge on that. If any of you have uh, uh, extra knowledge on this, maybe you can share. Uh, I, I, I can say something. I don't have extra knowledge on that particular project, but I thought what would be really important would really be for communities in Singapore to, to really uh, enable that community to become dementia friendly dementia inclusive you know so how, how do we do that you know, as a community not as a private or individual service provider uh, or any individual units but, but really as a whole community how do we develop this com uh, dementia friendly dementia inclusive uh, society communities will, will be very key and that would be an interesting um, I think a, a topic that co of conversation that we can have actually Yes, yes, I agree with you, Kim Chu. We certainly could be more empathic and could be trained to recognize and to support people having dementia because it would also help the caregivers uh, to um, be able to reach out to neighbors to help uh, in respite care, for example, uh, so that the caregiver can at least take a break. Any of the others want to add anything? If I can uh, echo Kim Chu's point, uh, I think it's also important to raise awareness of uh, the condition so that uh, uh, everyone knows uh, what are the things that also can help someone or persons with dementia. And uh, to each in place, I think uh, the inclusive part uh, has to be uh, in place and everyone, including the neighbors, the community uh, have a role to play. Uh, to ensure that uh, uh, those persons with these conditions, they are also able to move around within our community. And if they need help, uh, there'll be someone out there to help them. Yes, thank you very much. There are some questions about the digital divide between seniors and uh, younger persons, and also how can there be greater intergenerational cohesion uh, perhaps through schools, curriculums, or perhaps uh, even in community projects like intergenerational projects. So if any of you have uh, any example to share, this person would like to know more.
Yeah, I, I think, you know, I think one, this, this um, digital divide, I, I think one way that we can bring the different generations together is really to have our younger folks be the teacher of the older person in, you know, in, in this uh, digital competencies. I, I think the young these days are very intuitive about technology, you know, they I mean, you see a three-year-old kid knowing how to use the iPhone, for example. You know, I mean, it's, it's quite common, right? So, so I think that, you know, if you can bring them together in, in a project, and I think it's already happening, you know, in, in some areas, in some of this, uh, there are already some projects like that, I believe, you know, uh, I think that that really will be good. I, I've seen some videos on, like, having school children teaching the older person how to use uh, you know, the computer, for example, you know, but I, I think if you can think like that, that would be great. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the comment was that sometimes uh, seniors have problems with vision or hearing. Uh, with vision, I suppose the font can be made bigger or a darker background might help. Uh, but uh, people having a certain uh, hearing loss Perhaps uh, hearing aids could be uh, sponsored by organizations or even uh, private companies uh, that are offering hearing aids for sale could have perhaps some discounts or some uh, set aside for those uh, who really cannot afford the hearing aid because hearing loss is very prevalent in the community. It is one of the most common conditions that seniors suffer from. And many do not even know that they are having a hearing loss because they've never been for diagnosis. And they just treat it as one of the conditions that come with old age. But uh, for the audience out there, perhaps if you have grandparents who are suffering from hearing loss, you may encourage them to take advantage of the health screening offered by Ministry of Health uh, on a very uh, nominal basis, uh, they can go for health screening for hearing loss and vision loss. Uh, perhaps, Taiket, you want to mention something about um, how technology uh, is uh, perhaps an area that can bring generations together, because I believe you have uh, done some research on uh, technological divide between generations. Uh, yes, uh, thanks, Prof. Yep. Uh, uh, in my personal experience, I see grandchildren uh, fussing over their grandparents and teaching them how to, how to use smartphones, uh, Zoom, and even WhatsApp. And you can see that they really bond and they, and they, and they get together. So I, think, so I think this will be one way that uh, we can also extend this uh, beyond, beyond the family circle uh, to the schools and even to the community. And, and it will be a meaningful way for uh, both parties, one, to benefit in terms of learning technology and also for the young uh, to learn about aging and, and, and what are the issues that one needs to uh, look out for, as uh, Prof Meta mentioned, on, on the tactile functions, uh, visual, auditory. These are the, these are the things that, uh, that may have been taken for granted. Uh, at a certain age, because you can move your fingers very fast, you can swipe. But to someone uh, who is of a different age band, uh, they struggle with some of these functions. And having this, uh, this uh, exchange would also promote uh, intergenerational bonding. If I may just add on to what Tai Kat said, you know, I may absolutely agree with him, but, but, I, I, but I, I think what would be uh, important perhaps if, if we really have projects like this for kids to teach older persons mm. how to use uh, you, you know how to use all the tech stuff you know would be you know before they go and do that perhaps to have a kind of an orientation for these children you know to so that they have a better understanding of what aging is and and what it feels like to to you know, to age. I remember when we did that guided autobiography project. Before the kids started the interviewing of, of the yeah. older person, we, yeah. we had an orientation session with them. We made them do aging sensitization exercises. We had them talk about yeah. what it feels like, you know, and and their own experience of of older persons. You know, before then they start doing that job, so to speak. You know, and and I think that makes a difference because it 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 
it, you know, so that they don't go in with a fixed mindset of, you know, what, what an older person said, but they, they are being exposed to a, another perspective of, of aging of an older person. Yeah. Thank you very much. I just, uh, yeah, I just yeah. wanted to add one point. Um, the ideas here, I think, are fantastic. I'm just wondering whether how we can mobilize uh, the younger generation because they are very, very good at tech. Um, so, for example, right, we work very closely with our IHLs and Institutes of Higher Learning, for example, and Yan Poly have a very strong startup community. And, and, and it's possible, for example, we throw some of these challenges to our younger generation as part of their courseware, right? They could come up with some of these interesting ideas or as in the startup community, they can also hear some of the problem statements from our different com care organizations, for example, in this area, right? And let them come up with ideas and prototypes. And this can then involve them in the whole service journey of how, you know, uh, 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 a senior person goes through uh, from end to end, right? From the start, from you, actually, what's the motivation to do this? Right down to the really what I was saying, the tactile part of it, right? The auditory part. So, and then you involve them in the whole journey. At the end of it, the both the institutions in terms of the IHLs and the students benefit from in-depth understanding. And at the same time, there could be certain working prototypes that could be could well be you know usable in a sense. So, and ultimately, you don't need something that very high tech and something very advanced. You need just something that's that's workable and our seniors can use and we can you know it can, then build on from there you can sort of develop a, a momentum for that so i feel it's really about mobilizing different parts of the ecosystem to come together if this is a real problem and this is something that we really want to invest in i think there are different points ecosystem we can activate to do this yeah okay great thank you so much <clears throat> there are a few questions related to the topic of career opportunities for people who are graduates from the grad dip program in gerontology or the master program in gerontology. <clears throat> they may be from NTU or from SUSS. So um, as my uh, previous uh, experience with SUSS has shown, some of those earlier batches of graduates, uh, they have gone on to build their second careers. Uh, for example, they may have been from um, a lecturing background, they could be a poly lecturer, or they could have been um, a banker or accountant. And they've moved on to build second careers, either in the healthcare sector, or even uh, as uh, managers of organizations. So this question has many uh, different aspects to it. So I will throw it to all of you as well. Uh, I thought I'll just start out by saying that there are uh, second career opportunities for people who want to switch lanes. I call this switching of lanes from one to another kind of uh, sector. And it requires a lot of adaptability, flexibility, and willingness to learn. Uh, some of them have had to take a pay cut, but very soon within the span of about a year or a year and a half, they were earning what they used to earn before they joined the sector. So it means a little bit of patience as well. So I'll throw the question open to the speakers now. Uh, anyone can start. Maybe I start with Taike. What do you have, uh, uh, you know, as a piece of advice, and then uh, perhaps uh, Kim Chu, and then end off with Shelvin. Thanks, Prof. Yes, uh, I am uh, very passionate in volunteer work, and I would uh, suggest that uh, when someone is exploring maybe a career change or to have a sense of what uh, the industry is offering. You can always go there as a volunteer uh, and, and, and see for yourself whether that is something that you want to do and to know the ins and outs of the work of the organization of the industry and what entails uh, before making the switch. Or you can also uh, do it as part of the internship. So SUSS uh, offers internship. Uh, it gives great opportunity for students uh, to have a different perspective 
from the industry and also the companies uh, that are considering hiring them if they are keen to take on the offer. Thank you. Kim Chu? Yeah, just add, to add on to what Taiket said is that I, I think, you know, if you've had, a, if you've done a gerontology course and, and actually staying put where you are, I think you don't, may not even need to change, uh, change, change lanes, like you said, but if you stay put where you are, I, I think it's really to see how you can transform, help to transform that sector that you are in into more I mean, more elder inclusive, for example, you know, more elder friendly, for example. I think that would be so key because, you know, older people will be amongst us all, I mean, the whole society is aging. So wherever, whatever we are doing, whether it's in the banking sector, whether it's in the uh, hospitality sector, whatever the sector that you are in, I mean, even in the prisons, I think our prisoners are aging as well, right? So how do you bring that into the sector and to have to transform it so that it becomes, um, you know, older person friendly? I think that would be really great if, if you know, that can happen. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Kim Chu. I think some of the uh, literature has uh, mentioned that we should mainstream gerontology. That means our frontline uh, officers in banks, at the post office, at um, CPF, and so on, they all need to do a short certificate in gerontology so that their attitude and their mindset becomes more positive towards aging, as well as they will pick up signs of dementia or signs of mental health uh, problems in their clients. And they could alert this so that there can be avoidance of fraudulence or any kind of abuse of the senior. So really, uh, once Singapore matures as a society, we need to think about mainstreaming gerontology. So even CEOs of all nursing homes need to do maybe a short course in gerontology so that they can understand their residents. Thank you. How about Chelvin? May we hear from you? Yeah. Thanks, Prometa. Um, how we see it is, um, I fully agree. I think there are certain roles that lend itself very much to a, a person trained in gerontology. And these are roles that we see today. Um, but like what you said, uh, increasingly, we are also seeing gerontology skills being embedded in different, different broad-based roles. Um, this is very interesting because we, we, because we it's essentially we look at different economies, right? And one of the growing economy that we all hear about is the green economy. And when we deep dive into the green economy, we realize that the people who are needing green skills today are not your green roles today. These are your BD managers, your financial analysts. And to them, this is a skill, not a role, right? So that's why we realize actually in even in care economy, while the various spectrum of the care economy will require gerontology roles across spec the whole spectrum, right? From the healthcare to the com care to the uh, social care side, even to the sports and wellness side, right? But many of the other uh, broad-based um, uh, impetus is to equip many of these horizontal roles that are not within the gerontology area with some of these skills that they better appreciate. They then can better uh, both the front end and the back end cater to different parts of a service journey of uh, 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 catering to older persons in our community. And if you can envisage this becoming more and more prevalent, even you and me, I, would, I think everybody would prefer a community that has, where everybody is on a watch out, you know, are equipped some of these skills, may not be professionally uh, to that certain extent of a professional, but appreciation, the, I think the community will become a lot more um, uh, um, easier to, I mean, more comfortable for us all age in um, uh, um, uh, uh, dignity and independence. Like, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, Chelvin. So I will now summarize uh, and uh, we have a few minutes left to wrap up and I'm being reminded that uh, this session is going to end soon. What I would like to say as a moderator to use my privilege as a moderator that the future labor force scenario is very exciting and I think people with a multiple array of skills will be needed. 
and understanding of the needs of caregivers, understanding the needs of uh, seniors, both at the third age as well as at the fourth age when they reach their 90s and even we have centenarians in Singapore. I think as a society, we need to be age inclusive. We need to see this whole society as being consisting of many generations who need to work together and the COVID-19 pandemic has taught us a very important thing that we all need to work together to build the society so that we are age inclusive. I would like to say to those graduates from these uh, gerontology programs, please do not hesitate to send cold letters to organizations either to volunteer or to seek an internship or even to ask for a job because today we do not wait for a vacancy to be announced many people are searching for jobs and many employers are looking for versatile individuals who can do a wide range of skills. So with that, I think we have come to the end of this session. I would like to apologize for those questions that were not answered and we will try and get some of these answers over to you. Not now, but a little bit later, hopefully. And to me, as a moderator, I would say I have been very, very privileged to moderate this session. I have learned a lot from the speakers as well as from the questions asked. So with that, I wrap up this session. Everybody, please stay healthy and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all the speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I think we had a very insightful discussion for today. I'd like to thank all the participants today for your active participation. Now, um, I'm sure all of our speakers here have tried their best to answer all the questions, but due to time constraints, uh, do note that we are unable to answer all the questions that we have today because there is a, a lot, okay? Now, uh, don't lock out just yet, okay? Before you leave, I have some resources that I'd like to share with uh, everyone. Now, just now, I think there was a lot of question regarding uh, furthering of education in gerontology. So for those of you who are interested to find out more, you can visit the website, the Singapore University of Social Science, uh, do note that they also have a Facebook page where you can find out information on their latest, uh, latest information on their program. Okay, so do take note of these two links that you see in this slide here. Now, I also like to take this opportunity to share with everyone on NLB uh, mobile app. So for those of you who uh, have not heard of this, uh, do note that NLB, we do have a mobile app. And this mobile app is actually available on Apple App Store and Google Play Store. Okay, so to download, you can just scan the QR code, okay? Now, the good thing about this uh, NLB mobile app is that it has a whole host of functions, right? You can read e-newspapers and e-magazines, right? You can read uh, local Singapore press holding e-newspapers. You can search for a title of a book or, or, or resources that you like. You can find programs and events, and you can pick up new skills digitally. But uh, one of my personal favorites is that if you happen to have downloaded this uh, app onto your handphone, and if you are in any one of the libraries, and let's say you see a book on the shelf that you like, you can just uh, pick up the book and allow the app to access the camera in your handphone, after which you can just scan the barcode on the book, and uh, that's it. We have uh, borrowed the book already. So imagine if there's a long queue at the borrowing station, you can completely skip the queue. And of course, once you borrow the book, right, the loan information will be captured into the app. So you don't have to print out a physical loan receipt. So that helps with sustainability. And of course, uh, as a librarian myself, as, as someone who borrows quite a number of books, uh, you will end up losing the loan receipt and then forgetting you know, when the book is due. So I do like to encourage everyone to download this app and to try it out. Now, here are some 
books that are available in our library on the topic today, Gerontology, the basics, research design in aging and social gerontology, handbook of gerontology research methods, and the short guide to aging and gerontology. So if you have downloaded the NLB mobile app, you can just uh, type in the titles and they will show you the availability of the books. Now our librarians have also uh, worked hard to produce the resource list for the, all the sessions today. Now what you're seeing here is just like um, a small portion of it. So if you're interested to find out more, right? I'd like to urge everyone to right, scan the QR code here or to take note of this link, okay? The whole resource list is available for download of this thing. We also like to hear your feedback for the session today. If there are things that you like, uh, do let us know. If there are any areas that you think that we can improve on, we would like to hear from you as well. Okay, um, I understand that some of you may be rushing for the uh, second session, right? Coming up soon. So um, do, you don't have to fill up the feedback form now, but do take note of this link. Also, we have a time of your life mailing list, right? So you can consider to sign up for this mailing list. So once you sign up, right, you will receive email updates about our upcoming events and programs recommended meets. So to sign up for the mailing list, we also have a QR code here. You just have to scan this QR code below or take note of the link that is displayed there. Okay, the next upcoming program is senior living options around the globe. So participants who are attending this uh, session, you understand how our public and private sector organizations are encouraging seniors to embrace aging with grace. And with that, we have come to the end of the session today. Thank you for joining us once again, and we hope to see you for other upcoming sessions today. Okay, thank you and goodbye everyone.